What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, our sponsor is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. I know Connor is a part of Mastermind because I did watch a video of you talking about it. Um, today, we have Con- I'm really excited. We have Connor McCluskey, founder of BombBomb. BombBomb is an interactive email service provider. And basically, you can make quick and easy personalized videos embedded in an email to wow friends, family, or business relationships. I first heard of BombBomb because I got a BombBomb. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So I had to find out more. So we're here. Um, He co-founded a service company in the multifamily housing industry that grew to 60 employees, over $1.7 million in just four years. If that wasn't enough, Connor is also an owner in a vineyard and winery called Proper Wines in Walla Walla, Washington, and it was named the best new winery by Seattle Magazine. Connor, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So much good stuff to talk about here. Um, why the name Bomba first? Uh, you know, I at the time I was trying to figure out a, a, a good name uh, for a uh, for a company, I was a big uh, Seth Godin fan, mm-hmm. and uh, this was in 2005 or so. And I was like, "Man, I want I want something memorable." Mm-hmm. You know, the Purple Cow had just come out, and it's something that can be remarked upon. And so I was like, "Somebody had said, hey, Connor, you're the bomb.com.' <laughs> and I was like, "Bomb bomb." And so, uh, Connor, you're the bomb would not be a good name of a company, but yeah. So the bomb.com, I tried to buy from this Japanese artist. He wouldn't sell it to me. And then I found, I was able to find somebody who owned bomb bomb and bought it from them. And, and, uh, and that's, was the original idea video and email. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and this like, go back. When did this, when did you start? I want to go back to, cause you have a really untraditional, um, kind of education, uh, upbringing, I guess you could say, but, but tell me first about when did you start bomb bomb? Yeah. So I started bomb bomb. It was, uh, officially, uh, we incorporated in 2006. Okay. The, the, what's the idea, video landscape then? It's, YouTube isn't even bought yet by Google. There right. is no video camera on any phones yet. Um, and so you were so, fighting an uphill battle. What, what was the original idea? It was rough. Um, I was selling billboards and built up my business to about 150 clients. and Selling was, billboards? Like, selling billboards. And uh, – and, couldn't stay in front of those people and I was like people buy me they don't buy billboards Mm -hmm. and that relationship and me hanging out with those people but I couldn't get in front of them every month and I was like if I could just get in front of them every month and be myself and hang out with them and and do all that and I was like you're a likable guy they'll want to buy more from you yeah how, how how can I send myself and uh, and get personal because it's all about the relationship. Business 100%. is about the relationship, yeah. and so um, I was like, "Man, somebody should probably do this already." So I went online, looked for a company that did it. Nobody did it, and I I uh, I shot a video with my buddy who is the uh, video editing professor at Colorado College. We shot a video in his class of me and a green screen walking on, thanking people for my business and for their business and uh, sent it out to about 150 people, built some HTML. How did you send it out at that time? Because 
it's video is not prevalent html and then hosted the video and 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 cobbled together a bunch of technologies and it and it worked it did uh, so could people play the video in an email at the time or did they did it click the time, off? no it was a link to a hosted landing page yeah, okay. and um which at that time is still pretty cutting edge right yeah, I mean, yeah. Vi when I sent it out, I had, you know, and I had national, regional, local clients, everyone from the local realtor to P.F. Chang's was my client, and people were calling me like, how the heck did you do that? <laughs> we want the name of the company, and that did that, and I was like, ah, man, okay. Connor's the bomb. This out. That so, so, I, I uh, yeah, so at that point, I was like, man, I should start a company so what happened after that so you're getting all this demand just because you're sending it. and it is a viral thing because i was sent one and i was like this is really cool i love yeah. the person you know it's so personalized and it gets my attention it's not your typical email plus it probably takes them a shorter amount of time to do that than to write a long email uh, and to receive better so there's a, a big viral component anyone who receives one wants to become a customer exactly so, so what and do you so do yeah it's uh so that was a part of the success is that it's got a virality to it and it it mm -hmm. um it kind of is a self fulfilling prophecy um, when people use it more people hear about it and it just is it just goes so goes. people are demanding it at the time so what happens next when do you get your first official yeah. bomb bomb customer so between then and my first customer well. It, I had to learn software the hard way, so okay. I quit my job, um, cashed in my 401k, all my savings, um, started a company, started the company. So you went all in right away? Uh, basically, yeah. yeah. It was, um, yeah, I, I didn't know what I didn't know, and and um, and yeah, I it, software was a unknown thing for a sales guy, and so uh, I had to learn that the hard way by doing it all wrong. And so, by the time we launched our product, it was in September seventh of two thousand seven, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So, what did you learn the hard way? What were some of the early hard lessons? Anyone right now who's thinking of starting? A company, specifically software company. What well, some of the it's a lot the easier don'ts. now. Like yeah. we, I had develop. I didn't know what to ask developers, and so they were like, "We need to build this in Java," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." And it was just, and then we, I mean, we outsourced stuff to India. So I'd be on these calls, and they would be like, "It works," and then I'd be like, "No, it doesn't." And, they would, it was just, you know. It was like the software the development team was a big hurdle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big hurdle. I mean, it's a lot easier today because um, there's shops and different things that you can, you know, different shops that just specialize in this and it's well documented on the internet. And, um, there's a lot of blogs you can read about yeah. it. But back in the day, uh, it was not like that. So when did you actually launch, have a working product that you launched? Like how did, was the, how did that happen with the first customer? September of 07. It took me till February of 08 before we actually had a customer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was a uh, Casino. Casino. And the, the, wow. the, it was called Bronco Billy's Casino, and it's about an hour away. And how I got the deal was I said I would do the videoing for them for free if they bought the email product. So what do you mean by what were you going to do for them? So I went and videotaped with the vi and edited, like built commercials for them. This was before the time of the iPhone. And and video on your mobile phone or your or your laptop or whatever. Um, and so I would go out and shoot. So our first three customers, I ended up signing up like three customers: Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center and Waters Winery out of Walla Walla, Washington. Really? 
But at the time, where are you based out of? Are you in Colorado? Colorado Springs. You were in Colorado so at the time. I would drive wherever, film and edit video. I taught myself video editing through my buddy at CC. I audited his class for free. And, um, yeah. and yeah, that's how I got the deals. Was. So what's interesting, Connor, about that is it sounds like you found the pain points of your customers, why they weren't buying, and you basically solved that, that pain for them. Because exactly. video is not prevalent at the time, and they're like, "How are we going to do this video?" And you said, "Well, I'll do it for you." Is that? That was the number one objective. Yeah. So the objective was, "Oh yeah, great idea. How do I get a video?" Right. I got to pay for a production company to come out and all this stuff, and so I said, "I'll just be the production company." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because you were you were a little bit early, right? We were early. Yeah, even though you know at the time we we're, I was like, oh man, we're so far behind. But it, uh, it's, um, yeah. So what was, was the next? Was what was the first hire? I mean, I look at the, the bomb bomb team, and you have a slew of staff doing various jobs. Uh, yep. When did it stop being you and maybe like an outsourced software development team? Um. Yeah, we hired our first employee. I think six years ago, mm -hmm. seven years ago, um, and she was the original email designer for the Fine Arts Center, and I hired her full time. She was the first full time employee. Yeah. And um. And then shortly after, we hired our first uh, uh, software engineer. Yeah. That's a big decision at the time, right? Yeah, very big. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't pay myself for about four years. Wow. Yeah. So how do you live? Uh, Just off of savings and really? things like that. Because you bootstrapped this, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we've raised a little bit of friends and family, so you know when you have payroll and stuff, you gotta. You know, beg your aunt who is in town <laughs> for twenty five grand of her retirement that she's willing to lose. You, um, you want uh, ten times this? I have the <laughs> I have the solution. I you mean, just have to wait fifteen years. Was, but I mean, I we we've um we've used debt uh, in the past to like I call it the loan shark loan. So at a point we were probably twelve people. We were growing the business by about 200 yeah. customers a month. Wow, that's amazing. But it was a recurring revenue stream, right? Yep. And so it's small numbers, but it was stacking. Yeah. And so we were at, I don't know, how I think it was like $40,000 in recurring revenue. Yeah. So, and we were burning probably about 40 grand a month. Because the and more you the, grow, you need more team members. You need just you need it, the yeah. You got to have the marketing. You got to go. You know, um, yeah. you gotta you gotta you, you just gotta go. You gotta right. go. And so I knew that you know in a certain period of time that I would be able to bridge that gap, but I just needed like a year. Yeah. And um, so I convinced. Have you ever heard of like a fact? during invoice mm -hmm. fact no so there's there's this deal that companies they'll sell their invoices oh for a certain amount and then like every day you get charged like three percent or something like that so i convinced this lawyer guy who ran this thing called invoice bankers to i i showed him the lifetime value of a SaaS com customer and then i said i'll discount it at 60 percent so i said Hey, our average customers this and blah blah blah. The lifetime value of this customer is five hundred fifty bucks. Discount it by sixty percent for your risk, and then for every new customer, loan me two hundred and forty dollars. The reason why I call it the loan shark is because <laughs> you had to pay it back in six months, including principal and interest. It ended up being like forty seven percent. Wow. I, myself and my business partner partner personally guaranteed five hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow. in debt. And uh we ended up paying it back within within about a year, but we were 
We were, it was, it was. You uh, just needed the cash to grow the company. You just, I just needed the cash to grow the company. I knew, I knew the business model. I knew what I had to do, but, uh, it was, uh, you, you know, yeah. put all the chips in, you know, kind of, I mean, this is the real, I love hearing the real story. You know, sometimes this gets, you know, if you look at, uh, mainstream media, there's a lot of glamour and, and Ritz yeah. involved, but the reality is probably for anyone in the early days and even beyond that, it's not easy. What are some of the thoughts that go through your head in those four years? Because, you know, some people are thinking, well, like, is this worth it? I'm not, I haven't paid myself for four years or does that, yeah. does that not even enter your mind? You're like, this is growing. I can see this happening. Are there doubts creeping in at this point ever or no? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm like, obviously this doesn't work. I'm not making any money. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, you have doubts. Like, you're like, you look around and there's like, everybody's just killing it. Well, from the from the outside, right? Correct. And most likely, they're probably in the same situation you're in, or a lot of them. Typically, I mean, anywhere you go, you got problems. And so, it, it doesn't matter if you're Google or Facebook. What keeps you whatever. going, like, during those times, during that four years... It's, uh, you know, friends, uh, it, it was interesting. There's a few key people that like a CFO of a big, um, software or a, a, a fairly large size software company, I would go out to lunch with these people and they would be like, it would be like, okay, we got 300 customers. We got 600 and, and they would just be like, just keep on going. And, uh, and, and it would be, you know. The last day, we need fifty grand, or we're not going to hit payroll. And I meet somebody, or I like send a check over here, and I'm moving this, and I'm not paying this, and I'm touch. And and it was right. like, but when you hear from your customers that it changes their lives, right. and you're making impact, it's like. You know, you're like, if yeah. I can tell more people about this, if yeah. I can just. If I getting just traction get through. Yeah. And so um, talk about one of those early customers because that, that is a good way of getting through. Like you, you're delivering a high quality, valuable service and yeah. listening to customers who love it is probably a way to say, OK, I got to keep going with this. What is, what's one or two of those early customers that you were getting that feed, like some of the results they were getting, you were getting that feedback that kept you going? Yeah, the a, a big one was um, his name's Steve Passanelli. He was a vice president at Move, which owned Realtor dot com, and and, um, and this guy just showed up, found us on Google, signed up, and he ran a, a blog called Tech Savvy Agent. And we had realtors and and yeah. all sorts of different people using the product. Yeah. And this guy, he did a review on BombBomb. And within a day, we signed up like 40 people. And we we're like, wow. we we're signing up like four people a day. Yeah. And at the time, and he writes this review and it puts us on the map in real estate, which is about 50% of our business now. Yeah, I can see like when you go on your the BombBomb site, there's like sales pros, real estate, mortgage, automotive team. So I'm assume, I was assuming those are kind of the core real people that are big, using it. Real yeah. big for us. And so he, he really set it off for us and he was speaking in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people every day. And a part of his presentation – was on bomb bomb and he would mm. use it and he would talk about us right. and um that's huge and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget the first time i met him we went to a keller williams conference it was the first thing i i built a we we called it the body bag and we <laughs> bought it we got approved by them at the last minute and we needed a stand, but we couldn't afford it for the TV for this little 10 by 10 booth we had. And we showed up there and I manufactured with a Dremel Moto tool a TV stand. Okay. And put it in this body bag and shipped it through FedEx to down to here so we could have this TV stand. And, and we're going to meet him and he speaks in front of, I think it was like, 
I don't know, 50, 20,000 real estate agents. Mm -hmm. We sold in like four days. We doubled our business in four days. Wow. We went from 500 customers to 1,000 customers. I didn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> we would show up at 6.30 in the morning and there would be like 50 people around our booth like, why aren't you here? I'm like, this doesn't open till 8 o'clock. It's a good problem to have. And so it was like, man, this is going to be great. So that was a Now you have other problems like yeah. first world problems. So how do you onboard when you're used to, when it doubles your business overnight, mm -hmm. how do you manage that? <laughs> All hands on deck. <laughs> you don't go to the bathroom for, we for a week? It was, uh, you know, we, we went back home from Florida. This was in Orlando, Florida, and we came back to Colorado and we're like, okay, we got to figure this out. So we were like, we used our own product was was one of the ways that we did it but you know we were like right. oh how yeah. to do webinars for these people and figure all this out and you know on the plane ride back we're figuring it out and you know we're we yeah it was it was crazy what's some of the inflection points kind of you you remember with the product people giving cuz i'm sure the product got shaped through the lifetime so yeah, uh, mobile was big for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the video, it, it was, we went from, you know, I talked about the, um, this kind of me shooting video. And then the iPhone got the video camera and people stopped having that objection. Mm. Yeah, it, ca um, it caught up with your It with was your it like all of a sudden we just stopped having that question. Yeah. Um, so mobile was a big inflection point for us. Um, Gmail, uh, recording video directly to Gmail. Um, that's one of our products we have. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, that was a game changer. That's mostly what I use. You know, I'll, I'll use the, you know, the sending option to multiple people, you know, probably quarterly, but daily I'm looking at, you know. I'm using the Gmail product. It's uh, talk it's a about day. integrations because I'm sure you were getting that feedback, and you know you can't fulfill on all feedback. So, what's your process for taking in the feedback and deciding yes or no? We can't incorporate this Gmail function that I, that people want. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> product prioritization. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, 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 it honestly starts in a, we do a strategic planning process. Um, you might have heard of it. It's, it's, um, it started off with a book called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Mm -hmm. um, it's now. Vern Harnish. Is that by Vern Harnish? Yep, yeah. Vern Harnish. Yep. Um, and I, uh, I started, I implemented that eight years ago. And so that starts off, you know, it looks at, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal, which is kind of the 10 year breaks it down into three, one and quarterly. And so a lot of the product stuff has come out of that, um, which is actually is not as traditional as a lot of the way people do kind of product roadmap stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been very nimble when it comes to that because we look at, you know, SWOT analysis on a quarterly annual basis. We look at the product on a, uh, it, from a leadership standpoint where we look at customer feedback, employee feedback, yeah. and then we kind of look at the bigger kind of landscape both on an annual and quarterly basis. We're actually typically the product kind of roadmap or where we go, typically one out of the top five things that are, go, that are coming down the pipeline yeah. are either changed or uh, redone even on a quarterly basis. Um, and so it's, um, it's very fluid. When it because comes you get customer feedback probably every oh. day and then the team gives feedback. Um, so you log all of that and then kind of tabulate it and look to look at it as a kind of leadership standpoint. Yeah, yeah, and and it's kind of the you know the Apple kind of way. Some you know the loudest you know the 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 squeaky wheel gets the grease. It, it can't always be that way. Yeah. 
Um, and you kind of have to be forward thinking and being like, right. okay, what is, where's everything going based on these trends and how are we going to deliver things that people don't know what they, you know, what they need, um, you know, kind of give them what they want, but, and then get them going and then give them what they actually need. Yeah. You know, because I'm, you know, I'm looking through the website, and I would think a big pain point in this type of business would be integrations. You know, th- I mean, with development, that what you've done with Gmail, and then there's a Google Chrome app to it, and how that connects. I mean, the user just pushes a button, but there's so much back end stuff that goes in, and and you have, you have like I think Android, Apple, Gmail. There's like a Zillow Group integration or something. How do you decide? No. There is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a Zillow um, integration. Um, yeah, we've got tons of those. I mean, what's one you had to turn down? Because it just, even though you were getting the request, it just wasn't as big as the other opportunities. Yeah, so we we manage that in in multiple di- in in kind of a cascading type deal. So we look at partnerships on a strategic level and then it breaks down into kind of three different categories and and at the low level you know obviously in 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 real estate early on nobody did open apis um and so that's really tough and so um we look at that and so people come come to us constantly and integrate with us yeah. almost daily we we launch almost integration partners daily oh. um and then we look at that anyway through and that's based on a bunch of different criteria from number of people on their platform what's the strategic opportunity how does it fit into our customer base stuff like that so um there's a whole myriad of of there's a questionnaire we 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 have people go through if they want to be a partner and different levels. So so as far as the product, what's on the horizon? If if you could talk about anything, what's where are <laughs> things going with video? And then I want to go back a little bit and see like what have some of the big um, I guess changes in the product for the better? Uh, what what does that look like? Well, we've got a new thing that I can't talk about. Otherwise, mm. our guys are going to kill me. Yeah. Um, well, don't yeah, don't. I don't want anyone real. killing you. It's um, it, it's very top secret right now. But um, you know, it, in any software company, uh, one of the biggest things is people don't use it. They'll buy it, they don't use it, and so yeah. we we kind of have been working on this problem both in client yeah. success. And on the product side and, and and all over the business of how do you get people to use That's it? That's great. Yeah, how do you do it? <laughs> and and uh, because ultimately we know if you use BombBomb, it's, you're going to win. And you're going to win more opportunities by staying face-to-face with people yeah. and connecting in relationship with them. And so yeah. the problem that a lot of people have is they don't know what to say. They don't – and they just don't know – they don't use it, and so it's a habitual thing. They're used to maybe responding to email with just an email, and they're not used to, you know, recording a video or whatever the it's case. It's not is. a habit. Yeah, it's not a habit. And so we've been working on a product um, that should be coming out shortly. Um, we're teasing a little bit online right now. We're we're looking at a launch at the beginning or or at the end of this month, beginning of February, um, in the real estate vertical specifically. Mm-hmm. That will help with some of those challenges. And so we are super excited. The whole team has been yeah. focusing on this, and and um, and we think it's a new kind of category for the way people engage and interact. Mm-hmm um with people and build relationships so um so when when was the last major product release or not when but what was the the last you know like equivalent to now obviously you can't talk about but the last one like we can't talk about this and it released what was the last one that was a groundbreaking kind of change in in bomb bomb or what was released probably gmail um gmail is probably the yeah. biggest thing that kind of hit for us um that was a kind of a groundbreaking thing gmail is uh 
you know, we, we have done really well with it. People use it daily. Um, one of those kind of things, obviously we're constantly iterating, making things better, um, and, and constantly releasing software, but big kind of product would be Gmail. How long does that take you and the team to actually release and execute on? Because that seems like a big undertaking. It has been. Um, that's a great question. There's a bunch of different pieces to it, um, but um, there's probably a million pieces to it. Yeah. Yeah. The quarters. Right. Hasn't quite been a year, but um, yeah. That's pretty quick, actually. Yeah. I think. How do you manage, you know, like I'm thinking, okay, I use a bunch of different things, like, for instance, Contactually. Right? Yeah. And I think there was some stuff online I saw between you and Contactually. You both are there, I think, serve also real estate, too. Yep. How does it work if, like, Contactually, like, we want to integrate you, what you're doing with BombBomb into Contactually. Is that possible to do? Like if I sign up my contactually eventually, then I could use BombBomb or is that because, you know, there has to be individual users that are signing up for BombBomb. So Absolutely. are so, there like, well, how does a partnership opportunity like that? Yeah. So work? contactually has been a great partnership for us. Yeah. Um, v and Tony, I know those guys i have known them for a while. Yeah. Um, super smart guys done really well. Um, and so, uh, if you're familiar with contextually yeah. buckets, obviously sync with bomb bomb and then being able to reply to people with videos. Um, I that, didn't know that actually. And I use contextually. Yeah. 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 And so, um, that is a, a great way to personalize those kind of, I, I forget what they call it. Not touch. Like the, the scale mail. Or um, or... it, that touch that when you're touching your bucket or it's a reminder, oh, yeah, yeah. it gives you what you, who you should be contacting right. today or whatever. Um, yeah. it uh, you're able to re- reply to that uh, very personally with hmm. video. I like that. Okay, I have to check that out. And yeah. then there's an integration there, so people sign up individually through Bomb Bomb, and then they integrate, they sync it with their buckets and can actually. Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. That's good to know. I love, uh, yeah, I love Contactually too. Um, so culture, as you grow in the company, how do you manage the culture of the company? This is, yeah, that is a challenging thing. Um, you know, uh, values is where it obviously starts. Um, and so early on when we were, I think four people, I launched our values um, to the company mm-hmm. and talking about those values. One of the things we do in our, our quarterly offsites is you have to be able to tell a story about every value um, in the company. Mm-hmm. And so everybody goes around mm-hmm. and so relationships or fun, how, how are we living out fun? Yeah. How are we building this as a part of our culture? And so if you can't tell stories about it or how your customers are having fun or how mm. your employees or your people, um, and it's got to start with the top, right? So like if I'm not having fun, right. how the heck is anybody else going to have fun? Right. And so, um, and so that is a challenge once you get to – you know, 75, 80 people and it, it, it and, and there's evolutions to it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody can be around one table anymore. What do you and, mean? Uh, you know, we used to have, uh, Oh, lunches, because it's so big, you know, you. lunches around a table with 12 people and you're hanging out and it's taco Tuesday. And, and, uh, that's a part of the culture. And, and, um, but it's a real challenge as you grow to keep that going. Um, and so one of the things we focus on is, is uh, we have what's called a people team. And, and a part of the people team is to help build out the values of BombBomb 
and keep it in the culture. And, and ultimately, you know, one of the things that came out of the people team was what we call awesome office. Okay. And so I like the sound awesome of that. Office, every two weeks, um, it is voted or, or you nominate a person for the awesome office. And what you nominate is you say, okay, Connor, I, you know, I, Chad, am, am nominating Connor for the core value of fun. And Connor took me out. We played foosball and he kicked my butt and we had a blast. And, you know, it really, you know, got me out, had me have fun because I've been on the phone all day and all this. Um, and, and at lunch on Friday, when we get the whole team together, we read all the nominations hmm. and then the person that's in the awesome office, which is a corner office that's private. Hmm. It's got a sound bar. It's got, it's a, got fridge, a jacuzzi get it stocked with whatever right. you want. And you got a couch in there and it's got windows and the, you know, huge windows and it's real private and you can shut the door and, and, um, and that, that person gets to pick who's the next person in the awesome office. And so it's breeding a culture of uh, recognition yeah. of people because it's, it's everybody from the support people to the developers. And then you're building this public camaraderie of people recognizing other people for living the core values. I love that. And so, um, it's been a really cool thing. And How did you come up with that? It's um, our uh, director of education. He he heard about an awesome office situation in Chicago. Okay. It was some company in Chicago he visited and they had a – I don't think they did the core values thing. Like that was our kind of take on it. But um, it was a company in Chicago. He was visiting a friend and their company did – what was called the awesome office and it was like you got a week or something like that there so but how often does it rotate every two weeks two weeks yep yeah what are some of the core values fun is obviously a big one yep so relationships uh, is is our number one core value mm -hmm. so ties right into the product build relationships yeah. um humility hmm. is is a key core value um are we just hired what we call a people director, which is kind of like the head of HR. Um, and the reason why she took the job was she said, the fact that you had humility as a core value was why I took this job. Hmm. And so, um, so leading with those things, some core value, uh, flexibility, which is kind of the, you know, what, what I originally had is change. Mm -hmm. If you aren't constantly changing, if you're not reinventing yourself, if you're not, um, you know, constantly being flexible to the, you know, the daily things, then you're going to get run over. And then service, just serving people, taking care of people, making yeah. sure um, everybody's taken care of. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. So but kinda... relationships and people are kind of the the, the key thing. Yeah. Connor, on that note, on the service note, so I'm you know doing research, and I'm reading, a, scouring the internet for bomb, bomb stories, videos. So I find this one post, way back when, from seven, eight years ago, and this guy posts. I'm reading this, and it's a scathing review of Bamba. Uh, not not really a review of Bamba, but they said it misrepresented what was going on. And I'm like, oh God, and, but. In the middle of, you know what I'm talking about? In the middle of the post, you've never, you don't know what I'm talking about. In the middle of the post, he completely changes his tune. So it's this long post and basically saying, Bamba misrepresented. This is a long time ago um, okay. because it's claiming like it does video inside email and it doesn't. And midway, and he posted something on Twitter. And one thing he said is immediately someone said, and he didn't call out, your company basically said this this company is saying it doesn't it does Skin. video inside yeah. the email but it doesn't 
And then suggestions on Twitter came back, oh, you need to try BombBomb. It does this. And he's like, what's going on? The same company I'm talking about is the company people are recommending me to do to use. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. And the service part kind of strikes me as like immediately, he says immediately, Connor, mess- you know, the, the founder messages me and he's like, oh, um, and he, he didn't mention your company name at all. Like, how can we help? What's going on? And basically did a full explanation and and completely turned you know the post went from you know this company is claiming something it's not doing it wasn't really a scathing scathing uh post but to this is the best company they serve you know they serviced me right away they made the explanations and things like that so do you know what i'm talking about with yeah. that okay yeah, I, rem- I, I mean this is an yeah. old old post yeah, this, this yeah. must be this may name. be this must be eight years old at this yep. point. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I it, it I remember seeing it on Twitter and I tracked him down. Right. And cuz I couldn't figure out who he was and I ended up calling him. Yeah. And uh and talking to him Bill is like, "Hey man, well, you know, iOS and da, 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 and here's right. why I do a little, you know." You're and, like there's a percentage of of ones that don't get open, but there's a percentage the that do. That here's how this right, works right. and why we do it this way and yeah you know so i guess even back then eight years ago you're still living by the core values what's one of your favorite stories from one of the core values either one of the staff has said or you've experienced it sounds like the core values hall of fame stories i want i want i want i want a, I want a hall of fame tab on your website and hear the core values hall of fame stories yeah yeah oh man what would be i'm trying to think it could be under any of your i don't know any category relationships fun humility flexibility service that's my you know so far with my uh my research that was one of my favorites that service story i'm trying to think now i'm going back to our our off-site we were just at um uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give you one. Um, so we have, uh, BDRs, um, this, this, uh, this girl, Melanie, she's a BDR. So she sets appointments for all of our inside sales reps. And so Melanie, of course, the overachiever she is, she decides that every new bomb bomb employee um deserves a decoration of their uh of their with with hand sign deals and balloons and everything and she took it upon herself she does not she does not get paid for this she does not this is not a part of her job description um, and, and this came up in our, in our deal of, of flexibility of, she takes this on and we've hired, uh, 15 people in the last month. And she did this for every single wow. one of them. And she goes out of her way to stay late and to decorate their, you know, their little area and put up balloons and have people sign cards and welcome and all this stuff and just loving on people and and like trying to make people feel welcome and yeah. she doesn't have to do that yeah and and it's just awesome it, it's it's it, it's really awesome that that they that that she does that and it's like nobody it sets asked the, her to do sets it. the tone early on it does. Yeah. And so, you know, new people get that. And I mean, that, there's no protocol for that. Like they would just be stuck with a laptop. And, you know, I mean, if it were you, you'd be like, here's your station. I'll see you later. You yeah, have a problem. I'm over uh, there. Uh, yeah. No, I think you got to do something like, uh, I don't know. Like, uh, yeah. Like I would be a horrible onboarder. Like I've, I'm like, yeah, you just go to work, like figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah. So, so that's just a, uh, I love that example. And, and it's yeah. just a thankless kind of job yeah. that, that she just took on and, and then like she that. didn't have time even to do that. And, I love and that. Yeah. That. Thanks for sharing that Connor. 
Yeah. From uh, the marketing perspective, um, you know, early on, you're probably calling people and then you get this break with the person talking about you on stage. What do you do now uh, that helps get the word out? Oh, man, what don't we do? Um, we, a lot of it is, is the word of mouth type thing, people using it and then talking about us. Um, you know, we, we do do some online kind of, you know, marketing stuff, your typical content marketing. Our guys are, you know, Steve and Ethan. If you don't know those guys, they're awesome. They're some of the best in the business I've ever met. Just smart marketing minds. Um, you know, the whole kind of, uh, we do everything from Facebook to AdWords to trade shows to, you know, as as uh, as non technical as this sounds, where where we do or where myself still does well in marketing is being on a trade show floor yeah. and meeting people, whether they're customers or going up and being like, hey man. How can I can I tell you about my mom? What's going on? Like just meeting people face to face still wins the day. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's and I'm old school, old fashioned, you know, that way. Well, I'm that's like, that's sort of the premise of bomb bomb, right? I mean, that's the premise of bomb bomb, which is totally. face to face, face to face. And so, um, you know, and just being yourself. It's like people miss this polished, you know, I, I'm just Connor. I'm right. the same guy that I yeah. was. It's sort of what people have to get over when using Bomb Bomb too. If they feel like they need to make everything perfect and polished, they're not going to get anything out the door, you know. And you just have to become okay with it. But now the challenge is you have to get other people to be okay with it. Um, and, and that's why I'm curious of what, what the when you release the new product or a portion of bomb bomb getting people to use it is there's probably a component there it's yeah it's one of the you know it's one of the biggest kind of customer feedback we get yeah. i don't like the way i look on camera it's a tough one i mean that's a deep seated even it, it, even like you know startup founders or whoever who just they know they just need to get the product out there need it to be perfect or need it need it. I'll just do that once I do this and it's probably the same yep. with every single person creating a video yep and then you just don't end up doing it which then makes you buy a product you don't use and so um, yeah it's one of the biggest it's human nature you know I mean it's tough it's yeah just who we are and and um, yeah and, and, and that's and that is what will make this unique always because not everybody will do it. It's the same. It's the sales game. It's the, it, most people just don't do the basics. Yeah. It's yeah. like, show up, <laughs> just show up. So it's do like, you focus kind of on real estate trade shows or do you branch out into other types of trade shows? The uh, we we've dabbled a little bit, but our main focus in marketing has been um, has been real estate up to this point. Um, we've dabbled in some mortgage. We've dabbled, um, um, you know, I was at Dreamforce. That's a hmm. Salesforce is That's a big huge, deal yeah. for us. Um, and so we're starting to dabble in those things a little bit. Um, which uh, we're a big Salesforce user, and uh, yeah, we think there's a lot of other opportunity out there. This is a horizontal play. Anybody can use this product. Yeah, from 100%. My wife sending our Christmas card to the realtor to um, to a salesperson. Anybody yeah. can use it. Yeah. So talk about your love for Kenya. Yeah. So. Um, uh, back in 2001, uh, went to Kenya um, and was in a slum, met a guy. Why were you in that, Kenya? Uh, I went on a, a, a trip with uh, a pastor and they were doing music festivals 
and I was randomly signed up for this uh, <laughs> this deal. It was like, what are your interests? And I was like, I'm interested in Africa. And, uh, <laughs> and I ended up going on this trip, and I was the only guy. That went on the trip. All women. I showed up at the airport, and I thought it was going to be a trip of a bunch of people. I was the only guy, and this guy went off, and I ended up being in Africa by myself, basically. And um, you mean it was just you? I, it's not like you were was, a group it was full this of women. Pastor guy that was like leading it, but like he got sick or didn't want to, and so I met all these these reggae singers. This reggae this singer, sounds like a crazy story. guys. And I was like, can I just hang with you guys? And they're like, okay, we'll drop you off at your hotel every night. And so we just, I like immersed myself into this uh, Kenyan culture. And, um, and, and basically uh, that was right before 9-11. I got back mm. uh, two days before 9-11. Uh, about two years later, um, I get a call from the reggae singer and this guy's like, hey, my brother's coming in to uh, America. You mind if he stays with you? And I'm like, well, okay. So I go to Denver International <laughs> Airport, pick up this guy. And we get in the car. And I'm like, so, you know, what are you doing in America? You know, how long you stay in? And he was like, you're the only person I know in America, and I'll be here for two months. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and so two What months was he doing here? He was a uh, he was a pastor, and he um, he was trying to raise awareness about these this slum. Hmm. And, Are you uh, married at the time? I was not married. Okay, good. Um, Your wife's like, "Who's this and, uh, guy, and why is he staying with us for two months?" <laughs> You're getting kicked out. <laughs> I was like, "Oh man!" And so he was. Uh, so I ended up becoming good friends with him. He. He stopped eating for a day. He found these kids in the slum in this area. And it was uh, Sudanese refugees would come down. It's in northern kind of Kenya. And they would come down and this is where they would settle in the slum. These kids are like starving. And so him and his wife said, we're going to stop eating one day a week. Hmm. And the money we would have for that food, we're going to feed as many kids as we can. Wow. So all these kids come out of the woodwork. That's really amazing. Yeah. And um, so I end up going there with them, become really good friends with them. And I met a guy that ended up starving to death. Wow. So I looked at this guy in the eye and he was like, I'm going to starve to death. And I was like, it didn't register to me that someone could starve to death. And two weeks after I left, I got a call from my buddy, and he said um, that guy died of starvation. Oh my gosh! And I was like, and then it became real. And so, yeah. and you saw it. I mean, what did you see when you you went to the slum and you visited it? What kind of paint the picture a little bit? It's like uh, wooden wood sticks bent over with plastic huts. Mm -hmm. and like people eating dog mm. it's really messed and is up this like just are there families or is this just in like kids, kids? it's it's mainly widows and orphans hmm. um so grandmas and real little kids because um the parents either leave or they died of aids or whatever the problem was um and and it's just these widows and orphans, and it impacted me. I was like, I'm now held responsible. Right. For someone that didn't bring home an income for four years, was like, didn't have much in my cupboards, like, you don't have, there's still stuff in the cupboards. Right, right. It's not it's, zero, yeah. There's not zero. And I could go to my friend's house and they would feed me dinner. And I mean, it's all right. You know, right. there's 20 bucks in the bank account. There's $20. Right. And so, you know, I looked at that and I just kind of said, man, I, this, this life is worth, uh, 
is 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 more than just me and it's not about me and so i need to make you know it it drove my purpose and so relationship and so what do you do with kenya now well i just got back in october um is is interesting one of our quarterly goals we did a um uh we built a greenhouse and so it's one greenhouse for the office uh, it's one thing to sponsor a kid to feed them, but it's another thing to build a greenhouse and then teach a kid how to raise tomatoes and then sell the tomatoes. Right. And so we, uh, one of our quarterly goals was if we meet our quarterly goal, as owner of this business, I can say, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to buy a greenhouse for these orphans and that. Where is the greenhouse? It's in Kenya. It's in Kenya. Yeah, so we paid for it to be built and now they grow and they produce about, I think it's about 200 kilos of tomatoes a week. Wow, that's amazing. That which are, which create jobs, which teach the orphans how to, how to do all this stuff. And then it supports about six and a half kids full time to, um, to be fed, to be clothed, to be mm-hmm. sheltered, and to go to school. Wow. So we ended up just buying another one at the end of this year, huh. and then um, and then I'm looking at buying semis and different things. And and uh, that's amazing, Connor. There's a whole. Thanks for sharing that. There's a whole thing there. So you want to erect more and more greenhouses basically for food and employment and opportunity for. Yeah. My whole thing is, okay. Um, what happens if your support from the U S goes away? What, what interesting, um, what unique things can you do in Kenya, um, that support itself? There's a huge, the biggest entrepreneurial ecosystem and people coming online is Africa. Really? That is the largest. I mean, there are so many people that the amount of, in Kenya alone, it's 60% of the population is under the age of 22. And there's 48 million people in Kenya or something like that. And so you've got all of these people coming online as consumers. And so if you can, and they're people, they're entrepreneurs. And so what I found out was that Katali Kenya is the breadbasket of Africa, basically. And so they have three harvests a year of corn. Not one, like the Midwest. You have three. It's like this black, red, deep soil that just produces crops. And so I'm like, let's invest in agriculture. What does the agriculture infrastructure look like? Yeah. How are the roads? Should we buy semis? Should we gr- buy grain elevators? Should we buy drying how do you process those things what is that what are the markets what do the ports look like and so we're trying to develop um make investments and things like that that you know and it started a very small amount when we when we started we i bought my buddy enough to make a chicken coop and buy 150 chickens and he put it in his backyard yeah. And it grew into, I think there's now chicken coops for 4,000 chickens. There's four tilapia farms. And so what they're doing is the kids now eat tilapia and then they sell the rest. And then the kids learn that business. Uh, the, the tomatoes is a whole thing. The chickens is a whole thing. And so they're not only teaching these kids – the way of entrepreneurship, but they're teaching them that skill and then we're investing those kids. So what do you do with these kids once they get out of high school or college? You, you got to help them start a business. Yeah. And so 
now the kids that we originally started, you know, with 15 years ago sponsoring, now we're looking at helping them get the startup funding for a pharmacy, for a hair salon, for all sorts of different things. And so you're not only teaching them skills and all the things, but you're building in a workforce and being able to then pump money into those systems. And it's all localized. It's becoming self-sustaining. Self-sustaining. Yeah. And so the that that whole so there's a so now what that became is it became a um an orphanage with 200 girls 100 boys um there's a feeding station and a school now about ready to be high school to help um i just bought like a, a sewing an industrial sewing machine because when you have 350 kids in school, they all need sweaters and uniforms. And instead of buying them, we make them and we pick the widow out of the, um, that was in the slum. And we're like, you know how to sew this? Oh, what if you had a $2,000 sewing machine and now they can do that. And now it's, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that, Mm -hmm. There's just tons of opportunity there. Yeah, that's amazing. And so yeah. capital, mid-market capital is the problem. And so I'm like, hey, what's the next project we can fund? What's the next project? What's the next project? Yeah. And so. It's great stuff. That's what I love. Yeah, I love that. So the winery seems random. <laughs> yeah, so it it it. it it does seem random, and so. But that was one of your first uh, customers. Uh, not our one. Not this one. Oh, okay. Um, but the guy who got me into the wine business, his winery, um, and so, uh, so wine's a very interesting thing. So wine opens up doors, and it helps you build relationships. So if you have a bottle of wine from your own vineyard and winery, hey. Well, come over and hang out and drink some wine. What do you do over wine or over dinner? You build a relationship. That goes much deeper than just something on the very shallow level. Mm -hmm. And so what the winery, uh, the idea was, first I was just fascinated in the idea of the wine business and and everything from being a farmer to um, making wine and being able to do that. So... Technology, very fast business. Wine. So I bought a cherry orchard in 2006. Cherry. I incorporated Bomb Bomb a month later. So I started these two things at the same time. Wow. And um, and from the time we bought the cherry orchard until I opened my first bottle of wine was six years. You have some patience. So, bomb bomb, two hundred customers in a, in a month, and now you know you, you, we get two hundred customers in a day sometimes. To the wine business, you harvest it, you stick it in a barrel, you let it sit, you let it sit, <laughs> you let it sit for eighteen months, then you bottle it. You let it sit. Then you release it. Years and years from planting a vine to actually drinking your wine. And so it's this real interesting contrast of, you know, but ultimately it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. Bringing people together, something you can talk about. It opens up door, like, I mean, from the CEO Zillow to... You know, um, anybody want anybody's interested because the the typical adage in the wine business is, um, how how do you make a million bucks in the wine business? You start with four. There's actually something to that. <laughs> right. it's about four million bucks to get something going. Yeah. Our story is something very um, uh, interesting. 
we got in on a deal of where typically you have to buy 40 acres and, and in order to have an estate vineyard. We got this deal from a friend of mine and it was grandfathered zonings from the 1800s from this old mm. family that, uh, that grew apple orchards and cherry orchard. And it was the one piece of zoning in Oregon <laughs> that you could say you had an estate uh, winery and make an estate bottled wine off of something less than 40 acres legally. And so the other thing was, is that there was a house on this property. And so I was able to get a residential second home loan on the property in order to get the deal. And so like all of these things came together and, and, and it was able to pull it off where typically you'd have to have 4 million bucks in capital in order to do it. And I got a residential loan and worked a deal and yeah. And so, and then all off the gamble of that, you know, this land is is yeah. I want to tell a story off of land and I want to do it to build relationships with people because ultimately that will grow both of my businesses and and, and it's fun they work together so where can people find out about that purchase it check it out properwines.com Proper um, yeah. yeah it's uh, join the club. It's one, one, one release a year. It's a single vineyard Syrah. Less than 1% of all wine made in the world come from the people that grow it and make it. It's a very unique thing. And it's a, all the juice in that bottle comes from one place in the world. And that's our little vineyard on eight acres in in Milton Freewater, it's called the Rocks. It's these huge cobblestone rocks. I actually have one. Yeah, pull it out. This is a rock from my vineyard, and it it basically all the soil is just two hundred feet deep of these rocks. Really. It's very unique place. It's one of the it, we just got um, certified through the TTB. Oh, excuse me, I just burped. <laughs> you were like uh, thinking of the food and the wine. You. <laughs> like, man, I was uh, the TTB regulates what's called an American viticulture area, which we are one of the only sub ABAs. Um, it's called the Rocks of Milton Freewater. It's it's very uh, unique place in the world. And it's the reason why I, I took the gamble on it. All right. People check out properwines.com. You know, hearing the story, Connor, is thank you for sharing the Kenya story. The proper wine sounds great. Bomb bomb. You know, the story is amazing. People may think, well, Connor comes from a pedigree of, you know, did really well in high school, went on to college, went to wherever some elite business school then went on to start these companies right but you had a little bit of a non-traditional path yeah yeah so um i was a art major at lansing community college Uh, i did that for one year and then uh dropped out and moved to colorado and um the interesting part of that story is my business partner now um, I met because, uh, I was stoned and drove <laughs> underneath the, um, uh, hotel, uh, deal with my mountain bike on top and ripped the headset off of it. And so I couldn't ride my mountain bike and I met my now business partner drinking beer and said, oh, I need, I don't have a hundred bucks to get this fixed. And he said, come paint the atrium of this hotel. I'll give you a hundred bucks. We get chatting, blah, blah, blah. He was like, you should just come work with me. And, uh, and I'm like, sweet. And so, um, 
that atrium, we now, in the tower of that building, we now have the seventh and sixth really? room of that building. Wow. And the people we sub the business from painted our whole floor. So what did he have like a painting business or what was yeah, a painting business? A painting business. And so we started a painting business and then um, that got us into the deck business and, and then that's what turned That was the multifamily, multifamily housing thing. industry. Wow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it all started with the broken bike. Broken headset. Broken headset. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Connor, yeah. That's crazy. So it why was, did you move surreal. to – when you were moving to Colorado, what – why? Why Colorado? What were you intending to do? Well, I'm from Michigan, right. um, and I loved skiing in the mountains, mountain biking. And so I always wanted to move out here, and uh, I just didn't have an excuse until then. <laughs> <laughs> you just made your own excuse. Yeah, yeah my parents uh, were not happy that I dropped out of college. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, – I wanted to be in the mountains, man. They're calling me, and so I've got a, I've got a love the mountains. Yeah. yeah. Well. So you went from college yeah. to Colorado to the painting business to the multifamily housing industry, and then to the winery and the bomb bomb video billboards. Oh, billboards. Yeah, yeah. We lost everything in the multifamily. We uh, we were growing just hugely fast got into like remodeling and deck building and all this stuff and we didn't use lawyers or accountants and we got completely jacked out of like some contracts and people not paying up and fulfilling on their end of the bargain and we ended up yeah we we had you know 60 people about on staff and we were you know i was early 20s and didn't know what I was doing and, and uh, you know went for broke and about went from went broke and uh, ended up uh, getting a job as a uh, intern at Lamar Outdoor Advertising um, so I went from running 60 people in about November to about February 1 I was filing uh, things a in little bit of a different there yeah and so, and I was living in somebody's basement. The, the mechanic next door, that uh, we had an office, and there was a mechanic next door. He was like, "Hey, I know you're losing everything, and uh, if you want to live in my basement, you can." And so, I did that. Got That's nice of him. And uh, and then you know built my way up in at Lamar and and um, you know hustle. So did you learn this hustle entrepreneurship, your parents, or where, where does this come from? My grandfather, he, um, my dad's an entrepreneur. My grandfather was a huge influence. Um, uh, but yeah, my, my, my dad and my grandfather are both, both uh, entrepreneurs and it was, you know, you work your my my father run ran a metal finishing company, and he was like, "Here's how you start. You start off on the lawn crew, and you mow the lawn for like five years, and then you go over to your grandpa's place and you mow the train tracks, or you weed whip the train tracks for a month." And that, like, one summer, my grandfather tore down a, a warehouse, and it was all the beams for the warehouse, big metal warehouse. And he said, you know what you're going to do this summer? <laughs> you're going to, for $4.23 an hour, you're going to take that, that um, he had a grinder, and he says, you're going to grind all the metal to bare metal and then paint it. And so for a summer, wow. he would drive, he'd pick me up from my house, drop me off, and he'd be like, go grind that 50-foot, those, those 90, 50-foot beams, and then paint them. Right. My uncle called me up like a year ago and said, 
we finally scrapped that metal building that grandpa made you do. <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? And so they would just, you know, it, it was a, it's Michigan, Midwest, work ethic, you know. You work your butt off. You do everything so you know it. Like at Bomb, Bomb I answered all, me and Darren were the head of support. I mean, we would yeah, answer the call. Steve, who's now our CMO, the VP of of um, of Move, we ended up hiring him. He would call in. I'd be like, Bomb Bomb. He'd be like, Connor. I'd be like, you know, I'm just trying to keep, uh, you know, close to our customers. And <laughs> he didn't <laughs> know we. I actually had to answer the phone. Right. And so, yeah, he. It was. It was. Yeah. Uh, well, I see a book, like if you ever do write a book, um, it's a true grind. You know, like you experienced a true grind from early on. Yeah, true grind. Yeah, so. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like what I said. It's, I mean, you show up. Yeah. You just go. You just keep on going. Yeah. Perseverance. Kind of thank you. I really want to be the first one to thank you. This has been hugely valuable. I everyone should check out bombbomb.com exactly b o m b b o m b dot com and, and check it out. It wowed me when I first got my first bomb bomb, and uh, also properwines.com. Um, any final parting words, Connor? That anything we missed with uh, lessons or, or stories? No, it's. No. Uh, I, I was talking to this this guy on Saturday, electrician, and he was he was doing some stuff. He said, "What what what was your um, what's your one word of advice? I want to start my own business." I was like, "I don't I don't know." <laughs> oh my god! Now, yeah. Now you have an answer. It's just and, grind, uh, and you tell and, that. Story. And I thought yeah. about it, and and he laughed, and I said, "You know." The biggest thing that I did was when we were at four people, I set out, here are the values I'm going to live by. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hold myself accountable to that. And, and no matter what, no matter, it, it doesn't make economic sense a lot of the time. But if you can go to bed and if you can leave it all on the field and knowing that you lived up to those values, it doesn't matter what people say about you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Check out bombbomb.com. Connor, thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now.